Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to Backing Britain, our first event with Graham Hackland, CIO of uh, Williams Formula One. So just before we get started and I hand you over to Graham, I'd just like to introduce him and um, just tell you a little bit about what he does. So um, Graham is the Chief Information Officer, CIO at the leading Formula One teams, Williams F1. With over 23 years experience in F1, Williams brought Graham on board to drive the digital and information technology transformation program. So today Graham's speech will focus on both F1 and Williams Advanced Engineering, who take F1 drive technology and apply it to lots of other industries. So thank you again for joining. Um, I'll pass you over to Graham now. Any questions, please leave them in the Q&A there. And um, I'll be here uh, on hand if you have any issues at all. So um, Graham, over to you. Thank you, Yasmin. Hello, everyone. Uh, I've really been looking forward to this. I think uh, often we don't make enough about uh, what we do here in uh, in Britain, uh, especially around manufacturing. So I, I hope that most of you know that the majority of Formula One teams are actually based in the UK. And uh, Formula One is considered, I'll say one of the most, I don't come across as arrogant, one of the most technologically advanced sports in the world. Um, and so I think this is a huge boost for manufacturing in the UK. Uh, so Frank Williams set this team up to go and challenge the big teams, take them on. Uh, we manufacture our own uh, uh, car here in, uh, in Grove. So we're quite near the village of Grove in the UK, which is not far from Abingdon, which is not far from Oxford, for those of you that know the area. So we're in Oxfordshire. Um, we have an extensive supply chain that we work with. Um, but we, we, we will manufacture a majority of, of our Formula One car here on site. It's obviously been a very strange year for all of us uh, and for manufacturing, it, you know, it is difficult. Um, you know, we've had to make a, a lot of changes within our organizations uh, to cope with the pandemic uh, during this year and make it safe for our workers to return to work. Um, so that's been, that's been a bit of a challenge. Um, Yasmin, I, I'm, I hate to interrupt myself, but there's some noise coming through on another, um, on another uh, panel with my name on and I'm getting, I'm getting sound coming through. I don't know if you can mute that one. Of course, yep. So I'm just Thanks. gonna remove that one there. Sorry, sorry everyone, that's just noisy. <laughs> and I, I'm not experienced at newsreaders, so I can't listen and talk at the same time. Thank you. Everyone. No worries, that's all sorted now? Yes, yeah, thank you. Um, so, so we're based here, been manufacturing the car in the UK for, for a very long time. Uh, every year we are um, re, you know, redesigning the car, uh, and rebuilding it and obviously with with the pandemic at the moment things are going to be a bit strange and there's going to be some carryover into next season for for the formula one teams and then we'll ramp up in 2022 when the, the big regulation change comes in and we all we all go for it again and uh, uh, aerodynamics changes and the, the the wheels change and the whole handling of the formula one car will be very different from 2022 and that's all done from here uh, in grove uh, in oxford uh, as i mentioned um i i love that Williams have been building this Formula One car and we go racing and, and for us it's about being successful in Formula One. We've had a tough couple of seasons but we're starting to see improvements for us and we're just focused on on getting Sir Frank's team back uh, to the front of the grid. But I also love that we take what we do in Formula One and we apply it into all sorts of other industries. And I, I wanted to share with you a bit about what we're doing uh, in Williams Advanced Engineering uh, today. Uh, I think most people know Formula One, you know, lightweight materials, uh, aerodynamics, thermodynamics, uh, the vehicle technology that, you know, that Formula One car has been a hybrid car for a long time. So there's a lot around uh, energy saving that we've applied then into other industries. And I wanted to tell you a bit about uh, what we've been doing there. Um, because I think it's not well known the work that Williams Advanced Engineering uh, do. When I, when I talk to people, they say, oh, I didn't know Williams did that. Um, and there are a couple of the Formula One teams who are taking what they do in Formula One and applying it elsewhere. But I'm not sure that anyone's doing it to the scope that uh, Williams Advanced Engineering do it. And I'm really proud of the work that they're doing. I, I joined Williams uh, back in 2014 to help with the digital transformation. And part of that was being able to onboard customers quickly into uh, advanced engineering but also to help the Formula One team to, uh, to help them to improve uh, uh, comms uh, uh, mobility, to make sure that they could work from anywhere in the world securely. And towards the end today, I wanna to touch a little bit around risk and the risks that we face in, in manufacturing organizations and organizations that have high value IP. Um, but that digital transformation that I came to help with 
some of what we did, we actually got a little bit lucky once uh, once we hit the pandemic and we had to send everyone home. It's very difficult for manufacturing uh, part of the company to be able to work effectively from home. So we had to get those people back. So we had a 63 day Formula One shutdown uh, where we did no Formula One work at all. And that was the same across all the teams. But then once we came back, we needed to make sure that it was safe for our for our staff to come back to work. Um, we still have quite a lot of people working uh, remotely now. Uh, Formula One historically was very much you're on site, you're working here, you're at your desk, very long hours. Uh, and, and we've managed to, to pivot that in a very short space of time that uh, almost a thousand people were working regularly away from this site, uh, working from home all through the lockdown. Uh, but we're now starting to see more and more people being able to come back to site safely. But certainly manufacturing were the first people we brought back and had to make sure that we looked after them and that we could continue to produce our Formula One car. Uh, we've just had the first six races of the year. So for those of you who have been watching the races, you'll have seen that. It's been really tricky for the teams to, to get parts made and get them out. Uh, we've done a couple of double headers. We did two races in, in Austria on consecutive weekends and we did the same in Silverstone. That was a, a little easier, um, but also obviously we're, we're traveling uh, extensively now and we've got to get our, our parts that we've manufactured uh, out to the track. And there are some challenges being presented at the moment. So before I go into what advanced engineering do, I, I also just wanted to mention some of the work that uh, William staff did during this lockdown that uh, you know, we've all been subjected to. Um, some of our staff uh, you know, volunteered in different ways to help with the effort. When the ventilator project uh, and, and challenge went out from the government to, to look at ventilators, Williams got involved in five different ventilator projects, uh, helping to various stages. Uh, some of it was uh, CAD design, uh, some of it was uh, you know, taking old units and helping to manufacture them and redesign them. Um, and one of the most successful was Penlon, which many, many of you may have heard of. Penlon are a, a local organization to, to where we are based uh, here in Oxfordshire. Um, and we're very proud of the work that we helped with the other Formula One teams, UK based Formula One teams. We really helped Penlon to, to scale up to uh, they, they were producing more units daily than what they had produced uh, in the previous eight months. Uh, that was the demand that was put on them as an organization. And in fact, they've shipped over 11,000 uh, ventilators uh, out to the NHS and our staff volunteered and whatever skills they had, if they, if they worked in manufacturing on a Formula One car, they were now on the assembly line uh, helping to, um, to get these uh, ventilators made. If they worked in logistics here, they were, they were helping with the logistics and, uh, and, and using the skills that they've got in, uh, you know, here at the Formula One team uh, into, into helping Penlong. So really proud of that. We did a few things around uh, advisors and whatever, I've got, I've got one here that we produced. Um, again, staff took the components home and, and you know, during the lockdown and, and assembled them, put them together. And we, we made those available to NHS trusts in, in the Oxfordshire area. And we used it as part of our return to work uh, process as well, having these, uh, these units. If I go around the factory, which I don't do very often because I want to I want to protect the workers there as well. Um, I've got to wear that, uh, and it's and it's really you know been successful for us in terms of uh, getting everyone back and being able to work uh, in our manufacturing facility. And we've all had to make those adjustments uh, this year, which has been quite uh, it has been quite difficult. Um, so Williams Advanced Engineering then taking what we know in Formula One, and I talked about lightweighting materials, electrification, uh, aerodynamics, thermodynamics, and also the whole process of how you produce a, a, a Formula One car every two weeks. Uh, every season, the big major change, adapting to regulations. I mean, there were reg regulation changes this weekend during the race uh, weekend. Uh, they, they, they clarify the rules and, uh, and things change. So we have this regulator that, uh, that we have to deal with as well, which often breeds innovation. I say to the engineers, aren't you frustrated that the regulations change so regularly? And they say, no, it just helps uh, with the innovation. They constantly have to innovate. And then the regulation will change and then it's a whole new rule set to work to. So they, they, they really like that. So taking all of that knowledge and know-how, we applied that into uh, lots of other industries. We started out working with uh, Jaguar on, on the CX-75. If you haven't seen that car, uh, have a look at it uh, at some point online. A uh, beautiful car. Eventually became a car that they used in one of the Bond films, Spectre, as the baddie car. Um, and, it, and it was a you know, fully hybrid vehicle, taking F1 technology and applying it into, into a road car. We were then able to take what we'd done there and put it into Formula E. So the electric formula, which is uh, just finished season six, uh, 
uh, you know, really successful formula, driving the development of battery technology in a way that I think wouldn't happen without sport. So that's also sometimes why I think sport is so useful and so interesting. Uh, it helps to drive uh, innovation, I, I, I believe. And I think battery technology that's going into road cars is benefiting from the work that's being done in the, in the series like, like Formula E. So we then took that battery that we developed for Formula E and we did the first generation and we've just won the supply for uh, generation three. So we'll be supplying to Formula E again in the future. Uh, and we took that uh, and applied it to all sorts of things. Uh, a bicycle, uh, worked with Brompton uh, to help with an electric bicycle. So shrunk all of that technology down to the pedelec. Uh, and, and it couldn't add too much weight uh, to the bicycle either, these folding bicycles that you take on trains. Uh, so that was uh, fascinating to see them shrink this technology down. Um, then we went bigger again and, and put it into other motorsports. Um, the, uh, the, there's two new series coming up, Extreme E and uh, the, uh, the, the touring cars, the electric touring car series. Uh, we're building and helping those uh, series, uh, putting technology into there. Uh, we run one of the Formula E teams, uh, which is really giving us a lot of knowledge around, you know, taking Formula One, how you run a Formula One team, but applying it to, you know, electric vehicles, which which can be quite different and, and, and interesting. Um, and, and, and having then done you know, some road cars, we started, to, we, we continue to do that, working with Nissan on the Blade Glider. Again, if you haven't seen that car, beautiful car, have a look uh, online. Uh, Lotus with the Avaya, Aston Martin with PD. So we've got these beautiful cars that we're helping uh, with the technology. Uh, and then uh, one of the more recent projects we worked on with Anglo-American was a mining truck. So, uh, you know, turning these huge monster, great big trucks that are working in mines and, and making them uh, much more efficient and, uh, and putting electrification into them. And that, those are really fascinating projects, I think, um, because the energy savings and so on are really doing you know, amazing things for, for the planet. Um, and it's really important uh, as, as we move away from, from fossil fuels. Um, we worked with Airbus on the Zephyr, which is a high altitude pseudo satellite. I, I love that one as well. So, so we're doing cars, we're doing satellites. We did a boat with Jaguar, electric boat to go and uh, uh, set a speed record uh, up in the Lake District. Um, again, a, a really you know, cool project. And if you've seen anything about Williams recently uh, being announced, uh, I, I like uh, the fact that we've just signed up to help the electric scooter scooter championship. Uh, so we're going to produce these uh, super fast scooters, and uh, in in 2021 there'll be uh, there'll be races, and I'll, I'm really looking forward to that one as well. So a lot around electrification, uh, you know, uh, around energy efficiency, uh, making vehicles more efficient. You know, lightweighting of the materials. We've looked at how materials are, are you know are made. Uh, how we do carbon fiber right now. We obviously got 3D printing facilities that we've been using in Formula One for a long time. We're applying that to customers as well. Uh, so that's been pretty cool. Uh, and I think, I wonder, you know, there, there'll come a time when, when Formula One will be doing much more 3D printing of, uh, of the carbon fiber than, uh, than is happening right now. Uh, and maybe we'll even be taking our manufacturing facility with us in the back of a truck to a racetrack somewhere in the world and, uh, and, and printing off the parts so you have a you have an accident on Friday and you you, you don't have to carry a whole truckload of spares like we do now. You just print out the parts that you need. I, I think that's in our future. We'll see. Certainly the technology is there. And we're seeing that with three D printing. Um, in lightweighting uh, and, and aerodynamics, uh, advanced engineering has also built solutions and worked with inventors and so, some really interesting things. You know, in retail, we worked with Aerofoil Energy, uh, a really cool company retrofitting aerofoils to fridges in supermarkets. And uh, a huge number of the supermarkets now are running these aerofoils and it's reducing the power consumption 20, 23% in some cases, uh, sometimes they're seeing more. And when you consider how much of uh, uh, the, the, the cost of running a, a supermarket is actually in the refrigeration and in, in electricity, it's huge savings, but also the, the wasted energy, I hate, I hate the waste. When you walk into a supermarket and you walk down the cold aisle, we shouldn't be cold. The air should be in the fridges, and that's what Aerofoil will do. And I think that's brilliant. I really like what uh, what Aerofoil uh, have been up to. Uh, in aerospace, lots of interesting projects. We can't talk about all of them. Not all of our customers like us to, to talk about what we're doing. Um, but we certainly we worked with Airbus on a on a plane seat. As we're seeing flights becoming uh, longer and longer, you know, they're talking London to Sydney, you know, uh, becoming a regular thing. If you're going to be 18, 20 hours sitting in a seat. 
we're going to have to do some work around uh, making sure that uh, blood flow and uh, you know the, the, the health and safety of the passengers. So yeah, we did we did some work with Airbus. That was really cool. Um, one of our early projects, which I I love and I'm really proud of, is we worked with BabyPod. Uh, BabyPod is a unit that's used in hospitals to move babies around the hospital into an air ambulance or into a road ambulance uh, and transporting the baby. So it's a, it's a mobile transport unit. We redesigned that in carbon fiber. So using the same technology that protects a, a driver in Formula One, that survival cell that we've built for, for a driver, uh, we're now using that to protect babies in hospitals. And, uh, and, and I really love that. Um, so that's a the kind of a rounding of, of where we've applied some of the uh, technology. And there's, there's over 40 projects that uh, advanced engineering are running every year uh, in a wide range of industries. So, you know, if, if you're interested, go and have a look. Um, and often they're recruiting as well. And I'm not, I'm not sure if I'm supposed to uh, put a plug in there, but, you know, based here in Oxfordshire, um, you know, manufacturing some of the most interesting uh, technology. Um, I also wanted to mention what we're doing with uh, the, the Foresight Williams Technology uh, EIS Fund. Now, this is not a plug for investment. I, I, I'm not permitted to talk anything about investment and I'm not going to, uh, you know, I'm not uh, saying uh, that uh, anyone should or shouldn't invest uh, in the technology fund, but I want to tell you about some of the very cool companies and inventors that we're working with uh, right here in the UK uh, on, on some of the most amazing technology. So uh, uh, typically we only get involved where we can add expertise. So again, lightweight materials, aerodynamics, thermodynamics, uh, and electrification. Um, so to see some of the investments that, that uh, this fund has made has been really interesting. One of the ones, again, like BabyPod that I, that I really love is Open Bionics. So they, they are doing 3D printed uh, bionic uh, prosthetic arms. And I follow their social media and, and it's amazing to see uh, the impact that these arms here ha have on young people, especially, but you're seeing adults as well. Uh, you know, young people using these arms for the first time. Uh, I've seen some of the videos. It, it's, it's hard not to, uh, not to, not to tear up uh, really, really brilliant company. And I'm really proud that we, uh, we've been uh, supporting them, but lots, lots of interesting things around robotics. Uh, and, and uh, you know, a number of uh, companies that we've invested in there through this uh, um, uh, fund. Um, ultrasound sensors. Obviously, we're very good with sensors. You know, we've had sensors in Formula One cars. Uh, you know, certainly, we had the first data logger in 1979. So, we've had, you know, we've had sensors on Formula One cars for a very long time. We, we, you know, it's, uh, it's a, a device that yeah, travels around a, a, a Grand Prix track and we're taking data off it uh, in real time all the time. And we've applied that, uh, that knowledge and know-how and design uh, into a number of different industries, uh, you know, from, from pipes, uh, you know, uh, monitoring of pipes, uh, monitoring the electrical grid, uh, you know, all sorts of interesting industries that we're applying our knowledge of sensors to. Um, uh, monitoring systems. So yeah, again, we've spent so much time monitoring a Formula One car, uh, you know, making sure that uh, we can take action based on, uh, you know, the, 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 the real-time data that's coming off that car. And we're working with a number of industries to help them uh, to apply uh, our, you know, our sensor knowledge and into their monitoring systems as well. Um, I've talked about open bionics, but, uh, you know, again, you know, 3D printed, prosthetic arms, the, the, the cost is so much less than it used to be. Um, the wait time for, for people, uh, you know, so much less than it used to be amazing. So have a look at open bionics uh, on their social platforms. Really amazing, uh, amazing company. Um, so lightweighting, so including powertrains, we're doing some work uh, around powertrains, which again, we, you know, we were very familiar with in both Formula One and Formula E and in the road cars that we've worked on and, and, and developed. Developed. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's I, I think, a really wide range of very interesting companies um, that, uh, that we get involved in, in supporting and helping to improve the, the product or, or, or help them to bring their ideas uh, to, to life or just, you know, through the technology fund investing, often they just need the, the, the investment and, and a bit of advice and guidance. So uh, I think that's been really really good uh, for us as an organization as well we can take pride in what we do in so we've got formula one and racing and and the, pr the pride that we have in the history of sir frank williams's team um, but also the things that we're then doing more widely than that now i wanted to finish before we go to to questions uh talking a little bit about risk risk for manufacturing is you know there, there are some real risks out there 
Uh, I'm, I'm responsible for IT risk uh, at Williams and I work with my colleagues who are responsible for, for physical risk uh, within, within our organization uh, with, with uh, our operations director who's wanting to make sure that uh, our whole manufacturing facility uh, is, you know, is not compromised. Uh, we want to make sure that uh, uh, we can keep operating um, regardless of you know, what we face. In the pandemic, we had to send everyone home. People had to be able to work from home in a secure manner, move our data around, customer data around, and we needed to be sure that that, that, that was safe and secure. And we've got a number of partnerships uh, uh, you know, with, with companies who are helping us to track and monitor and show our customers that their data is safe uh, to, uh, you know, protection of endpoints, protection of the data itself, uh, protection of our internet connectivity. But no, no matter how much time and effort and money we put into that, a determined uh, external person who wants to get in onto your systems uh, will probably find a way. You know, some of the biggest organizations uh, in the UK and globally are finding that as, you know, as, as hackers are finding ways to get into their network. And so we, we put a lot of time and effort into building these layers of security um, to try and protect our critical infrastructure to try and protect our, our main you know, reasons for operating, going racing and delivering our customer projects. Uh, we want to make sure that uh, those are protected. So we put a lot of time, effort, money <laughs> into, into protecting our manufacturing systems. There are lots of good um, resources out there for all of us to use in manufacturing in the UK. Uh, a lot of good support from government you know, who, who want to make sure that uh, the UK manufacturing are protected. Um, so there, there's, you know, I, I'm happy to answer some of those questions around that or, or just have a look at uh, you know, manufacturing and managing of risk. I think we are a, tech, a target for hackers um, in, within manufacturing, uh, I, you know, I heard on the radio this morning again about uh, you know some of the the clinical trials that are happening around uh, you know um, around the, the current virus outbreak. Uh, hackers getting in to look at the research. The, the the researchers then can't be sure that their research hasn't been tampered with. So one of the things I always talk about is for both our customers and for Formula One, we need to be sure that our data is not tampered with. Um, it's all very well creating the car now. Um, you know, in Formula One, in three years' time, no one cares about this year's car. The cars have changed so much. But when we're doing customer projects and we're building technology for hospitals, for retail, you know, it's going into supermarkets, for road cars especially, um, we, need to, we need to know that that data has not been tampered with at all. Um, and that can be tricky for manufacturing companies. Often we are not able to uh, have the technology in place that, you know, will prove that there's a forensic uh, chain of, uh, of, of data that shows the whole you know, life cycle of, of some technology that, that we've produced. Uh, did someone ever get in there and tamper with it? And, and certainly you know, seeing what's happening with uh, the researchers on, on the virus uh, and, and, uh, and, and the work that they're trying to do and then the research that they're doing, and they can't then be sure that the data hasn't been tampered with, and then their clinical trial, uh, you know, will not get approved. Um, so you know, we do have to be really cognizant that there are external forces uh, who may want to get on our networks and uh, and and interfere with with our data uh, or take our data. And so I, I'm pretty sure we're all putting, you know, as much time, effort, and money as we can into into these protections, but knowing that. At some point, you know, it, we may be compromised, and then it's about partnerships. And it's about building partnerships with people who will help us to recover. Um, you know, we we work with a company who makes sure that all of our data, uh, you know, in in a Cronus, all of our data is in the cloud, backed up, protected from ransomware. And uh, you know, if if the worst happens, <laughs> and we have a way of re of recovering that that data. So I spend a lot of time really focused on risk, and I just wanted to raise it as part of you know what I was saying today because. I think it's something that worries a lot of us and for some you know, of our, our smaller manufacturing companies, you just have to live with the risk. But there are, I think, some simple things you can do around data protection, uh, backing it up, ransomware protection. There is some you know, basic hygiene that we can all do to, to protect our data and protect ourselves. So I'm probably going to pause there. Uh, I don't have a timer, so yes, no, I don't know if I've overrun or not. And I hope... Um, I hope there's some questions coming in. I'm happy to touch some more on you know, what we're doing at Williams, but let's see if there's loads of questions that I'd rather cover those. 
Yeah. Well, you got, you got it spot on, Graham. Um, you're exactly 25 minutes past 12, so um, we can move straight on to questions now, which we've already had a fair few come in. Um, so the first question is from Sam Taharia, who asks, how did you quantify the digital transformation business case before you rolled out its implementation? And additionally, what factors were considered as part of the ROI considerations? So, so business case, right? We all... I'm a, I'm a CIO, I don't know how many of the audience are, maybe, maybe many of you are probably not IT professionals. As a CIO, I hate doing business cases. Uh, but I, it, and it might be simpler for us on the F1 side than, than maybe it is for a lot of organizations, but I can see on advanced engineering, uh, you know, it's more complicated. In F1, if it's gonna to contribute to car performance, uh, car reliability, uh, it, it will uh, help us to stay within the regulations uh, or will bring cost savings we will find a way to make it happen. That, that's our business cases are built around those four main uh, criteria. And the digital transformation actually wasn't something, I, I've been quite lucky, a lot of CIOs I talk to are in an organization and they're pushing to try and get a digital transformation done uh, and, and the business are not receptive, the rest of their business are not receptive. I was brought into Williams uh, to help with the digital transformation that they already had in mind. So I'm never pushing uh, a board or an executive that don't want to do uh, digital. They know that digital uh, will help them be more successful in Formula One. And in advanced engineering, when we look at uh, um, uh, business cases, there are a number of factors, again, that we that we'll put in place. Uh, and it's not always about profit. Uh, I'm not sure, uh, not sure they're going to be happy for me to say this, but for a manufacturing company, for us, sometimes it's about developing the technology. Here's a technology that we think is reusable in other industries that we could um, create now maybe at a loss, maybe, you know, uh, not, not making a huge amount out of this one project, but we know that we will be able to take that IP and, uh, and, and commercialize it even further. So often we will look at a number of different factors when we, when we choose a project uh, and a customer in advanced engineering. Perfect. Okay, great. So um, our next question, um, we've had a few more come in from um, a few minutes ago. So uh, we'll just quickly go through these questions cool. and make sure they all get answered because I'm sure everybody wants their questions answered. So um, how did um, Williams first make the move from F1 to WAE? And what was the initial route? And that's from Jerry Williams. Yeah, so for, for us, it was that Jaguar CX-75 that I mentioned. Uh, having said that, they were, uh, all through... Um, Williams's history, uh, Sir Patrick Head, who was the head uh, in, in, on the engineering side, um, he, he actually started, before it was officially advanced engineering, he, he started taking projects outside of Formula One, working on some road cars. And Formula One used to have quite a, a cyclical uh, uh, workload. So in the, in the summer, the designers wouldn't have a lot of Formula One work. They designed this year's car. They hadn't started next year's car yet. And so they'd probably have two months where there wasn't a huge amount of Formula One work yet. The regulations were still being worked out. So you couldn't design next year's Formula One car yet. And so he would take on projects and they would do all sorts of interesting, interesting things. Uh, when um, the kinetic energy recovery systems first came into Formula One, which is the, the kind of hybrid nature that the cars became, Williams developed a flywheel. And uh, that flywheel uh, eventually didn't get used in Formula One because the rules changed and said you had to have a battery. Uh, and so Williams developed a battery system as well, which, uh, which then also got used in, in, in other cars. Um, but that flywheel actually um, got packaged in such a way that it could be used in buses and trams. Uh, and that technology got sold on. And I think that was the early genesis of actually we could be taking Formula One technology and applying it into other industries. But the first kind of formal project for advanced engineering was the Jaguar CX-75. Jaguar, uh, you know, fantastic customer and partner for Williams. And uh, we've worked on their, on a huge number of projects, like I mentioned, electric boats and cars and, uh, and, and all sorts of things. So um, yeah, and, and then, you know, once you start a business like that, you think, okay, uh, we don't wanna just stay in automotive because you know that, that's also a very cyclical, cyclical business. So we want to diversify. And that's when we started to get into all sorts of other areas. Great, that sounds awesome. So um, our next question is from um, Gary Scott. And he says, uh, there is a lot of talk around Industry 4.0 and digital for composites. Can you give any pointers on what SMEs that want to work in this area should do? Great. Yeah, so yeah, a really good question. We, uh, you know, I work with our ops director to look at uh, our factory of the future, where composites is going for us, 
uh, you know, in, in 10 years time, will we have a massive clean room with dozens of people working, you know, 24 seven shifts um, to make parts for Formula One cars? Time will tell. Uh, and how, mu you know, how, how much of that is going to be influenced by things like artificial intelligence? Uh, you know, we're going to be able to apply data from the track back into our manufacturing cycle, which may be, you know, kind of unique to sport, motorsport, and may not be, you know, applicable for, for the person who's asking the question. But uh, we're, the, the, at the moment, there's no right answer. And, and, the, and the difficult thing for a smaller, like SME, right? So you mentioned that we consider ourselves, okay, we've got 600, 600 people, but a lot of that is, is you know, really racing focused. If you take our manufacturing and, and design capability, we consider ourselves an SME. It's really hard to take a punt on any one of the directions that uh, that, that composite materials are going in, uh, and and put all of our money and effort into that one because if that doesn't succeed or that's not what uh, our competitors do, um, so we're having to take a lightweight approach, work with uh, lots of uh, different uh, partners, uh, bring different people in, stay open to you know whatever else is going on out in the industry, be open to what's happening outside of uh, Formula One, obviously, uh, and and we get a lot of that kind of information from advanced engineering. So, you know, working in rail, in aerospace, we're seeing what's happening in other industries and being able to apply it into what we're doing here. Um, but it, it is difficult for an, for an SME to know because by the time we get to, you know, uh, factory of the future, 2.0, 4.0, it'll be 6.0 and, and it's really tricky for us. You've just got to, you've, you've got to go but if you can find ways that you don't have to put all of your investment and all of your time and effort into one direction, uh, that's what we've tried to do. Great. Okay. So uh, our next question comes from Teresa Raventos from uh, the University of Leicester. And she says, my question is about data integration from the sensors. Uh, given the mass of data that one would receive from these sensors, what is the key element to consider in acquiring the useful data slash information? Yeah, I, I didn't talk a lot about data today because we were talking about manufacturing. Usually, uh, as the CIO, I always get asked about data. Um, the, the difficulty with data is it is growing exponentially and everyone thinks they want all the data all the time and all the data we've ever generated available all the time. Uh, and in fact, it starts to muddy the waters and your decision making gets, uh, gets clouded. Uh, as part of our advanced engineering company, we've got a, a, a bit of a consultancy arm who help other companies do what I think we do really well in Formula One, and that is filter data, narrow it down to the data you need to make this decision. Does this make the car go quicker or not? Um, is this going to help us to deliver this customer's project on time, on budget, uh, and within the design criteria that they, they specified? Uh, and so it's filtering that data down and not throwing anything away. We almost never throw any data away, uh, but it's uh, it, it's, so we, we'll often have multiple people looking at the same data, but taking different results out of it. And this is where I think also we look, we're tracking artificial intelligence, machine learning type solutions, maybe even quantum computing in the future to try and get, you know, it, as the data grows, if we want to add video data as well as audio, the car telemetry and all of this other data, or if we're doing a customer project for a road car, as we've been looking at some of the autonomous vehicle projects, uh, uh, there's huge vast amount of data that you've got to be, be able to process quickly and not make mistakes with. So the, the process of how you do that, we've, we've learned really well in Formula One and we're learning how to apply it to customer uh, projects in, in advanced engineering. Um, but it's for us, we found one data lake that you pour all your data into and if you're not familiar with the, with the term, apologies, but uh, in, in my world, they talk about a data lake. So you have this huge database that has everything in it. And then, and then you just press a button and the answer comes out. Uh, in my experience, that doesn't happen. And also building this massive data lake is so expensive and you never finish. You're always building your lake. So what we talk about uh, in, in, in Williams is data puddles, which I, I realize you know, sounds amusing, but it's have... Don't worry about where the data is. It's that extraction layer at the top that you really got to worry about. It's, it's what engine you're using to, uh, to mine the data, to bring different uh, data together. So the sensors that we've got in the Formula One car produce very small amounts of data, actually. But it's when you combine that data with, with other information about, you know, track temperature or, or, or other factors. That's what we've learned to do really well. Slimline down the data and then start to add in other, and, you know, other data to get uh, in, intelligence out of it. So for us, it's about streamlining, only giving um, the right data to the right engineer at the right time. Otherwise, they get lost. 
Great, thank you for that, Graham. So we've just got two more questions today. Um, so we've got around about five minutes um, to wrap this up. So um, our next question is from Luke, who says, how, how do you ensure a stable supply chain with the changes this year and the general design changes each year? Yeah, a supply chain and managing that supply chain and, and uh, the risks through a supply chain as well. You know, I talked a bit about risks for us internally, but secure, you know, securing our whole supply chain to make sure that they uh, can still supply us. Uh, a, a lot of the supply chain that Williams use, we've been working with for many, many years. They're people we know really well. Often they'll work with multiple Formula One teams. Uh, and maybe other other motorsports as well, or you know other industries, because they diversify a bit as well, so they're not just reliant on Formula One. Um, the fact that we're not going to redesign our car completely for next season will affect the supply chain as well. Um, and yeah, through this through this pandemic, it's been really tough. You know, keeping in touch with them, making sure they're okay. You know, we've got in our supply chain small organizations with a couple of people in them, uh, up to you know much larger larger organizations, and making sure that they're safe. Uh, and well and, and, and able to work through through this um, that we're able to safely supply them data move parts around it has been tricky I mean one of the things on the ventilator project early on was the supply chain when you're bringing materials from especially into the UK so when you're bringing materials in for assembly uh, that can be tricky you know when when uh, that kind of movement is, is not possible because you know we're in a lockdown uh, situation so that that has been tricky but just you know building relationships uh williams i i love how our procurement work it's not about screwing this the lowest possible price out of every vendor and supplier you know we know that we want them there next month next year we've got to work with them uh you know year after year building our formula one car so Look after, look after those relationships, uh, uh, support each other. Um, it, it, you know, it's very difficult at the moment because you know, some of the organizations that we've worked with may not make it through the end of the year as, you know, as things are getting tougher and tougher and tougher now. Um, so yeah, just working with them the best we can and, and supporting them the best we can. Great. Okay. So um, we've had another question come through, actually, just in terms of data puddles uh, that you mentioned a moment ago. <laughs> but we will uh, we'll get to this question first as it came in uh, before that one. So um, this is from our own Charles Addison, who uh, is one of the direct directors of the Maiden Group. And he asks, uh, with the world of motorsport under pressure currently due to COVID, how much more important has Williams Advanced Engineering been to the business by means of diversification and spreading risk? Yeah, I, and that's a good question, right? So the whole the whole reason that uh, Williams set up, I think formally, uh, advanced engineering early on was to create a stable income stream into the group. When you're when you're in Formula One and your performance goes up and down, so does your income, uh, and and so it's very difficult when you're not performing to get back to the top if if your income is is really down. So it was one of the reasons that they they established uh, advanced engineering. So I think it's been critical that uh, you know that, that we've had that because for you know, we, we got to Australia and then didn't race. And for what, four or five months, we didn't know uh, where we were going to get any income from. There was obviously no TV money. We weren't on TV. There was no prize money because we weren't racing. Um, so yeah, advanced engineering uh, is really critical to, to Williams. Great. Thank you for that, Graham. Um, so Data our, our last... <laughs> Our last and final question is in terms of data puddles, exactly. So what data puddle do you think makes the biggest splash potential to SME productivity? If you could answer that one. Oh, SME productivity. I'd love to ask a follow-up question of the person who asked that because it depends what you mean by productivity. If you mean, you know, throughput, how, you know, how can we get the most out, uh, you know, from the resource that we've got, whether that's human resource or, or machines or, uh, you know, whatever resources we've got, the supply chain, um, those data puddles are, I think, are easier to mine than trying to create one large data lake. Um, we've typically standardized on kind of Microsoft technology, but because I, I just found it would be easier for us to, to manage the infrastructure, the architecture, get the data available to people. They're familiar with that, those tools and technology. Once you start going into lots and lots of different uh, uh, technology areas, it can be tricky to have in-house skills to support that. Uh, if, if productivity was about you know, getting more out of people, I'm, I'm, not, in favor, I'm not in favor of that. Uh, uh, we just, uh, you, you either hire more people or, you, or you, you, know, you, you can't just keep people working crazy hours like they used to in Formula One. Um, but yeah, getting more out of the machines, 
you know, uh, reducing waste so that our, our operators are, you know, on a, on a, on a lathe or a machine or someone in composites is not building something that never makes it to the car. Um, one of the things we hate the most is, is, you know, something that goes through aerodynamics, through the driver simulator, into design, into manufacturing, goes to the track, and for whatever reason, you know, is not able to run on the car or doesn't add the performance that we expected to the car. So that life cycle of the Formula One car, we're constantly working on and refining. Um, each of those areas has their data uh, that, that, that moves around that life cycle in the data puddle. <laughs> Thank you so much, Graham. Um, that was an, an, an amazing speech, and I'm sure a, a lot of people um, found much value in that. I think one of the really interesting things that I found was uh, your work with Airbus and Brompton Bikes, who are also two of our speakers this week. So it's really nice. It really Great. ties in with the whole Back in Britain um, ethos that we, we're trying to put out there and, and Back in British industry. So thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, it was a pleasure to have you. Thank you very much. No worries at all. But before we um, wrap up today, everybody, I just wanted to say um, that our exhibition is now live and we have over 200 exhibitors. So please head over to backinbritain.com um, so that you can view those stands. We have over 160 uh, manufacturers there and um, 120 billion pounds of uh, of uh, responsible for manu the manufacturing uh, supply chain. So um, if you could head over there and, and take a look at some of the stands, that would be great. But um, thank you again, Graham, um, for joining us today. Thank you, Yasmin, I enjoyed it. Thank you. And uh, yeah, enjoy the rest of your day. And uh, anybody, if you have any other questions, um, I'm sure uh, I could email them over to Graham um, if, they, if you couldn't think of them now. So uh, yes, please send them over if you're, you're concerned. My email is yasmin at maidengroup.com. So uh, thanks again for joining.